I dare say there's not a person in this room who would walk into a situation that they knew was doomed to disaster on the off chance that they might survive and uh, spend the rest of their life uh, watching a legend, true or not, grow up around them. Well, I certainly didn't intend to do that. When I got on a ship that day, I, uh, I was intending to go home on the quickest ship possible, getting back to the United States. My grandson, I'd been told, was deadly ill, and I got on that ship so that I could get home to see to him. <laughs> well then, we don't know what we'll be remembered for. Certainly don't want to be remembered for that. But uh, in order to know, I'd have to have a crystal ball. I want to be remembered for my passion. My primary passion is reform. I couldn't have known it at the time, but growing up poor in Hannibal, Missouri in the decades after the Civil War gave me a lot of perspective for what I would be doing with my life later on. In those years, this country was trying to rebuild itself. And there are so many people coming through Missouri, uh, adventurers, ex-slaves, immigrants, all looking for a place to put down roots, all looking for a place to call home. And I saw it all. The poverty, the prejudice, the injustice. And now, having said that, my large Irish family was always looking for an excuse to have a party. So, no matter how you look at it, everything I experienced growing up helped me later on. So much news from the West in those days. Gold and silver strikes from Montana to California. And then in 1878, news from Leadville, Colorado. Old Horace Tabor had struck it rich with silver. <laughs> I don't think there was a person in Hannibal that didn't dream about going west and striking it rich like Horace Tabor, but most of the people I knew didn't have streetcar fare to get across town, let alone money to get to the Rocky Mountains. But that didn't mean we didn't all dream about it. In 1883, my brother, my sister, and her new husband went to Leadville. And three years later, I joined them. I guess we were all uh, deciding that uh, if we were going to have a chance to make it rich, we would do it there. I really thought that the way I would get away from my life was to marry a rich man. And there weren't any in Hannibal, so Leadville seemed like a good place to go. I found a man who I loved dearly all my life, J.J. Brown. And he wasn't rich when I met him. No, he was a mining engineer who'd worked his way across the country and had a considerable reputation as an exceptional engineer. In 1893, after seven years of marriage now, and some very exceptional mining engineering on his part, we were rich. Mr. Brown and I had had our dream come true. In 94, we moved to Denver, and I began a splendid social life. Oh, you might have heard that... Uh, that uh, the Browns were ostracized from Denver society. Well, I want to set that straight right now. I admit we were not part of Mrs. Crawford Hill's Sacred 36, the old moneyed set, you see. But the fortunes of the mining game are fickle, and you've got to be careful who you look down your nose at. Today's pauper might be tomorrow's millionaire. And so, no, we were not part of the Sacred 36, but well, invitations to my events and parties were coveted invitations. But it wasn't socializing that I intended to use my new life to accomplish. No. I might not have been a worldly woman at the time, but I knew that money meant a certain amount of power for a woman. And I was becoming what they called a new woman, one who could vote, one who could run for office, own property. And I intended to use that certain amount of power to make a difference. When I'd arrived in Leadville all those years earlier, I'd seen the difference between those who have money and those who work so that some can have money. And I came from the working class. I came from those who were working in the mines 
six, seven days a week, 10 hours a day to put food on the table. They'd come west with the same dreams as everyone else. And I never forgot that. Now, um, one of the people that I worked with was Judge Ben Lindsay, a juvenile court reformer who was making a lot of friends and enemies, sticking up for what he believed in. And that's my kind of person. Judge Lindsay had worked his own way up from poverty, got an education as a lawyer, and, and was working hard to reform the court system, to treat those orphans, those street children, the ones that society had thrown away. He wanted them to have a better chance, and he treated them better than anyone ever had in their lives. And I'm happy to say I helped. Now, he had a charity. He said he needed $5,000 to keep it open. I told him I'd get twice that. So I, uh, I put on miner's trousers, you see. I went up to Cripple Creek. Oh, it was one of Colorado's last big boom towns. And there were a lot of abandoned mines. And it was after the turn of the 20th century. And many of those mines had been, been left. They were just sitting idle. I went from mine to mine. I had my pick and shovel, and I got some ore from each one of them, and I had it assayed. And sure enough, the Independence Mine, Old Stratton's, a big, big boom mine for him. I went to the owners of the Independence Mine, and I said it was a crime to have good ore sitting in the ground when there were children in Denver that needed shoes. He had as much gold in his heart as he had in that mine because he gave us the lease free for two years. And uh, within six months, we paid off all our expenses and put $1,000 in Judge Lindsay's coffers. <laughs> I always like it when things turn out that way. Almost two years to the day after that senseless sinking of the Titanic, Another senseless disaster happened here, right in Colorado. Colorado Fuel and Iron Company had a number of mines in the state. And the Ludlow Mine, just down around Trinidad now, in the fall of 1913, the miners, thousands of them, went on strike. They were evicted from their homes, all those families and workers. They, had to tent, they set up a tent city there so that they could could uh, have a place to live while these uh, negotiations were being worked out. And the mine owners called in the militia. Now you've got to the mine, uh, the workers, and you've got the militia trying to get through the winter. None of them had adequate food. None of them had adequate shelter. And we were facing one of the worst winters Colorado had seen in a long time. What did they think was going to happen? In April of 1914, now, things came undone. And uh, there, was, there was a firing of that tent city. They set it on fire, and many lost their lives, including 11 children and two women. One of my heroes in this life now, reformer Mother Jones, put it this way. Smoke from an armed conflict can rise from the arroyos and ravines of the Rocky Mountains, and nobody cares. Nobody listens. Then Ludlow came and the nation heard. Little children roasted alive makes front page news. Dying by inches from starvation and exposure does not. Well, <laughs> I tried to remain neutral now. The Rockefellers owned that mine, and they were friends of ours. But the more I heard, the more, the more I realized that uh, this disaster didn't just happen for no good reason. Now, I visited. I visited the mines, and I saw the conditions in which those miners were expected to live and work. And I could no longer remain neutral. I lectured. I traveled. The next year, I worked hard to bring attention to this labor reform that was so critical to our country moving forward. And I, I have to say, it took almost that entire time for the Rockefellers to budge even an inch towards reconciliation. My family owned mines for years. 
And uh, we had our troubles, but we always met the just and reasonable demands of our workers. Why, back in those days, I even joined the union myself. I got a card and I went to the men and I said, I'm one of you. I never forgot where I came from. Well, now, <laughs> none of us knows what we'll be remembered for, if anything. I hope that I am remembered for all the work that I sincerely put in to making a difference. Denver, Leadville, all those cities, they were like every other city in the country at that time, all working for change, social, political, labor, reform, necessary. Well, now, if I don't stop talking, I'm going to be remembered for keeping you from having your lunch. So uh, I will ask if there are any questions, if anyone would like to ask a question of me. Um, they tell me, well, now I've got a couple of minutes left, so I'm going to uh, turn this over to somebody who might have something to say to you. Thank you. I'm going to... Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to take this opportunity to come out of character um, and to talk a little bit about this story, Margaret Molly Brown. Um, it's a story that of all, you talk about primary resources now. There aren't a lot, but the resources that are available are highly incorrect. And um, I wanted to just give you an idea of where some of this, in terms of her life and all the incredible good things that she did were overshadowed by the myth. Margaret Brown died in 1932 in New York, and in 1932, Jean Fowler uh, published a book called Timberline, which has a tremendous amount of uh, fictionalized Colorado history in it. That was a time when, I guess, they were telling the stories as embellished as they could. And in 1936, another uh, individual named Carolyn Bancroft wrote a little pamphlet book called The Unsinkable uh, Mrs. Brown. Mrs. Brown. It wasn't Molly in those days. And because of those highly embellished and inaccurate accounts, when they got ready to write that musical, The Unsinkable Molly Brown, they used those two sources. And so then they embellished that even further. So now we've got embellishment upon embellishment, and now here comes this story. Making Mrs. Brown into a, a sort of an, a cartoon character, a kind of a, a, a over-the-top, belly-up-to-the-bar-boys kind of a person that she was not in real life. And, uh, and yet, many sources continue to rely on what has been put before them. So. Finding good primary resource about a character like this, I was in a classroom just the other week and a young girl got up and she was going to do a portrayal of Molly Brown in the first three sentences she had five inaccurate pieces of information. I said, where did you get that? And she said, well, on the internet. So there's a great biography about Margaret Brown by Kristen Iverson who has gone in and unraveled the myth. In fact, that's part of the title, unraveling that myth. But it, she took great time and effort to gain the trust of the family, who no longer wanted to give their resources, their, their scrapbooks, their, uh, their uh, family pieces, to people who were going to make yet another cartoon character out of their ancestor. And uh, how, would, how would a person researching know that? It's a book about this thick. Maybe a student wouldn't want to read that. In there, Kristen also says that, that access to real primary uh, resources, letters of Mrs. Brown. Um, she did write an autobiography, was given to a publisher, and it has disappeared into the um, annals of time. So there aren't, there aren't a lot of real primary resources, but that particular biography is one that takes apart all of the inaccurate history and, uh, 
helps us understand the, the compassion, the um, humanitarian ideals that this remarkable woman had. And having said that, she didn't mind a good story. She said, if it gets you some press, it's all right to tell it. So um, she may have added to some of the misunderstandings about her life anyway. Thank you all very much. I look forward to talking to you soon.